present courts picked. Present courts are either picked by um, a, 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 a politician who loses the election and he gets appointed Supreme Court or he gets appointed to some court or he gets elected. Whereas in the private sector, the way the court judges would be picked would be based on um, a history of uh, brilliance in the law. So <coughs> don't think that just because private courts wouldn't work perfectly, and no one is saying they would, that they would therefore work worse than the present courts. The present courts have got problems too, right? I mean, uh, it takes years to get justice. So I, I, I think that this will work whether the people are contractually related to each other or not. If there's a, a drive-by shooting or something like that. Way in the back in the black shirt. How you, in, I'm sure wondering how you enforce, but by threat of force. I mean, against small people, this is easy. But say you have a large monopoly, how would you enforce any ruling against them that they can, by sort of by threat of force, say, I disagree? <laughs> Jeff Hummel is a professor out here somewhere in San Jose. He's very good on this one, and I'll be guarded by what he says on this one. He says that the pen is mightier than the sword. Why is the pen mightier than the sword? The pen is this big and the sword is that big. By the pen, I mean intellectuals and legitimacy. The reason is because the pen determines in which way the sword is facing. This is why uh, the intellectual class is very important. This is why the government is always suborning intellectuals. This is why the Fed is paid pretty much every money macroeconomist it, it, virtually all of them have been paid by the Fed to support the Fed. Uh, you're talking about some big monopoly. There is such a thing as legitimacy. Look, if 99% of the people really hate the 1% that is the monopolist, or the 90% hate the 10%, you know, they, they take pitchforks and, and fire and they go to the castle and kill the bad guy. What keeps the bad guy alive? What keeps the bad guy alive is he's got legitimacy. Legitimacy is very important. And here you get it from intellectuals and clergymen and other people like that. So I don't think that in a free society, what you're going to get is uh, Bill Gates uh, running roughshod over people. He can run, right now, he can rough, run roughshod over some people, but not fully. So again, it's a matter of comparison. You know, it's interesting. I, I didn't spend any time on courts. I should have. <laughs> and all the questions so far on that. Anyone got anything on, on any of the other stuff I've said? Yeah. Uh, on roads. Yeah. How would we get to private roads from where we are today? <clears throat> That's a vicious question. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> How would we get to private roads from where we are today? Some people say it's sort of like trying to unscramble the egg. You can't do it. Well, you know, this is the problem that the Soviet Union faced when they went from communism to whatever they've got now, plays on capitalism. You've got to figure out somehow who gets this factory. <coughs> well, you've got to figure out who gets this road. Well, I also favor privatization of uh, rivers and oceans. How do we privatize the Mississippi River? Who gets to own it? Well, the Mississippi River I like. Because it sort of looks like a road, it goes like that, and around here it sort of wiggles around. How would we privatize the Mississippi River? Why should we privatize it so we could bring it under the profit uh, nexus? How would we do it? Well, one way, if we had a God's eye view, if we were God and we could look down and see who homesteaded that, we can give it to their children. We don't have that ability. What we could do is say everybody who's got acreage on any side of the Mississippi River, and anyone who owns a tugboat that's been going up and down for however many years, the more years, the more shares in stock of the new Mississippi River Corporation. And for every acre you get, you get a, another vote. And now we have the Mississippi River Corporation, which has got 100,000 shares. Some people got five shares, some people got 10, some people got one. And now it's a corporation, and they run it. Well, so for the Mississippi River, so for Broadway, or for the I-5. The I-5 goes all the way from, I don't know, San Diego to um, Vancouver, no, uh, to 
Canada, the Can Canadian border is. And you've got, I don't know, 100,000 people with acreage on both sides. And then you've got truckers and people that have been using it. And somehow, you give it to them. Will we do it in a perfect way that if God saw us doing it, he'd say, yeah, you got it. <laughs> no. But better an imperfectly privatized road or a river than a public river where you have the tragedy of the commons and stuff like that. Young lady. As far as the road is concerned, like, well, I mean, making it private, first of all, you would have to set completely different rules. So, I mean, you'd have to privatize the DMV, et cetera, et cetera, which I'm sure in a perfect libertarian world would be perfect. But Not the DMV, my God. <laughs> <laughs> there are some things that we must keep government. <laughs> Not the DMV. <laughs> So you'd have just Maserati and Aston Martin drivers on the 80 road. You'd have the poor people in the, let's say, the 25 mile per hour road, right? Not only would they be late for work and then obviously fired because everything is privatized, but then on top of that, I mean, that's not fair at all. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> it's not fair. Okay, so the argument is that if we privatize roads, this would hurt the poor. Well, I, I don't really think so. I, I think that if we had a bus full of the poor, they could all chip in and you know pay a fare, and then you have 50 people on the bus, they could probably outcompete most people in a BMW, maybe not all. Uh, I think that the poor people, instead of their share of the 40,000 people who die each year, there'd be fewer people dying, and poor die as well. Yes. The poor would have less of a share, but they always have less of a share in everything. The poor have fewer computers. Does that mean we should nationalize computers? The poor have fewer uh, bicycles. Does that mean we should have public bicycles? No. Uh, the poor always benefit. It's true that initially they don't get it. Like when computers come out or when air conditioning came out. Who got air conditioning first? Bill Gates or the poor guy? Obviously Bill Gates got it first. But if we had government, probably only the, the Politburo would have air conditioning now. You know, I used to watch the Olympics in the 80s, and every time someone would win a, would win a gold medal, they would have an interview with them. And usually the people that are winning gold medals are aged, oh, 22, 25, something like that. And invariably, they would always show the guy driving around in a little red car and sitting in an apartment all by himself. And I'm wondering, why, why the, this constant thing? Whereas with the Americans, they show them in all sorts of contexts. And I finally figured it out. The only people that can afford a little red car in the Soviet Union were gold medal winners. The only people that could afford an apartment were gold medal winners. Here, if you work in McDonald's, you can afford a little red car. You can afford your own apartment. The poor do a lot better here than they do in, under any other system. They don't. Look. Do you know the people on welfare have color TVs, they've got air conditioning, they've got little cars. Uh, those are the poorest, I'm, I'm not talking about people that are mentally handicapped and street people. Those are people that are not in the economic nexus. Those are people that need charity. But people who work in McDonald's in this country, or in any country that has some vestige of free enterprise, do relatively well. I mean, you know, if you have air conditioning and you have a color TV and you have a car and you, you have a bicycle and whatever, you're not in dire straits. Whereas you go to other countries that don't have free enterprise or have much less free enterprise and the middle class don't have these, these sorts of things. The young lady way in the back. Oh, I was just going to ask if there would still be corporations. Can't hear you. You talked about the specific corporations. So I was asking. Yes, corporations are a legitimate pooling of resources. There's nothing. Cooperative. Uh, it's a cooperative. It's just a voluntary way of pooling resources. Why would you think that under libertarianism there would be no corporations? I thought they had special privileges. Uh, well, to the extent that they have special privileges, the special privileges would be gone. But the essence of Corporations per se are not an evil institution necessarily. Okay, so there would be corporations. I mean, a limited liability corporation is: you want to deal with me, you can only sue me for the amount that we've got in the till. You don't like that? Don't deal with me. So it's a legitimate uh, institution. 
we already had you. Yes, young man. Um, well, what I was thinking about the, the ownership uh, for, for endangered species, um, now the monarch butterfly, it flies, the, the swallow, the Steve's uses jaguar shark, an incredibly rare thing, you know? Um, how do you protect something that the Chinook stand? How do you protect something that migrates through, through different places around my corporations, through different corporations?